My name is Bill Drummond. Uh, I'm 56 years old. I was born in South Africa. Family moved back to Scotland when I was 18 months old. They came from Scotland. And left school, well, got thrown out of school when I was 16. Ended up at art school. Left art school and done lots of things since then. That's who I am. I don't really know what I am. I don't know what it is. I, 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 sometimes I think I should know what I am. Sometimes, sometimes I think maybe I'm a poet. Maybe that's what I am. Maybe just because I don't put words together on a piece of paper. Uh, and then other times I think, no, no, I've got to be brave. I've got to say I'm an artist. But I always feel embarrassed about saying I'm an artist. And because I've been involved in, in doing... Some people know know of my name because I've been involved in making pop records, so they think, oh, obviously he's a musician. Now, I can pick up a guitar and play some chords and sit down at a keyboard, but lots of people can do that, you know, and I don't think of myself as a musician. Even though, even though I've now written quite a few books, I don't think of myself as a writer either. As the technology to record music evolved through the 20th century, it sucked in and seduced every form of music uh, around the world. They all wanted to become recorded music. They all wanted to be this thing that could be bought and sold. And that narrowed the parameters of what music could do and be. And it, it, and, and it took away from music a big part of what, what can make music powerful, which is about music being about time, place and occasion. Because what recorded music wanted to be was is available anywhere and at any time. And I don't think that really came into focus for me until I got myself a, an iPod. And I loved the iPod. When I first got an iPod, I loved the idea of the iPod. The, the fact that I could walk around and have in my pocket here every piece of music, every piece of recorded music that I could have ever imagined wanting to listen to. And I could listen to it whenever, while doing whatever, at any time, you know. But within a few weeks of getting a, uh, an iPod, I found I was just skipping through tracks. I found I was, you know, even my all time favorites just weren't working. So somehow that was influencing my thinking about what I was doing with the 17. I was thinking maybe this is the end of the era of recorded music or the beginning of the end. And, um, and, and it, within art, each, each medium, has a lifespan, and um, what? And while you're within that span, you know we've all grown up with uh, recording. You can't imagine that that would never be the thing. So it feels for me, I feel, and this is something I've been saying for you know the past five or six years. Look, the generation to come, the the seventeen year old, the eighteen year old future music makers. I'm not going to want to have a MySpace. Maybe not going to want to have a website. They're not going to want to. They're not going to want to. They're not going to want to have mu make music that anybody can download anywhere and have and listen to at any point. They're going to want. They're going to want to do something that's special. They're going to want to do something that that is about a place and about time and that people go to. Now, I'm not saying what I'm doing with the 17 you know, is the future at all. It's the future for me as a 56 year old man. It's a way that I've been able to connect with making music. Nineteen ninety two, I thought I was leaving music behind. I thought music has been taken over, taken over too much of my life. It was a jealous mistress. I'm going to put music behind me and give room for getting on with other stuff in my life. But between 1992 and at some point in the late 90s, I kept on hearing these sounds in my head, these choral sounds, these, these um, and, and there's part of me that wanted to try and turn what I was hearing in my head into reality. And at some point, this music had taken on the name The 17, this imaginary choir. Now, I don't know why it was called The 17 or what the significance of the number was for me. There's no reason for calling it a 17. I don't know why it's called it. I mean, maybe there is, but I don't know what the reason is. Initially, what I can hear in my head, it's, it's male voices. Oh, and, it's, and there's no melody to it. There's no, 
There's no rhythm. There's no words. It's just these huge, big chor chor choral chords m moving around. Uh, so I got together a bunch of blokes in, in Leicester, in England, in a studio, and I put the thing together that night. And I didn't have it written down. I just knew, described, and tried things out and showed them on the keyboard. Uh, and it worked fantastically well. And that night, driving home that night, down down the uh, the motorway to where I was, it was then living out, uh, out in, in the country, um, I got a little bit, I imagined what we were doing could be this, but what we'd done that evening could be a CD, could be released, be a, this freak worldwide hit, and we could go out and tour concert halls around the world. But the next morning, I woke up and thought, nah, you know, nobody's going to want, you know, that, that's not going to work. But I also, this took a little bit of evolving, decided what I was doing with the 17, I didn't ever actually want to be recorded. I wanted it to be a thing that... Kind of, it kind of flipped. I wanted to be a thing they had to take part in. Just because the possibility, we have the technology to, to, to document everything, has made me, I, I guess, reject that and say, no, this is something that's not documented in that way. You've got to be there. You've got to experience this. The 17 is about getting a bunch of people together that maybe have never sung in their life or since they left school into a room or into a space and me getting them, it doesn't have to be me, it can be somebody else, to perform a piece, a score that is a set of written instructions. And for me to break down those barriers that they might, those fears about actually standing there, opening their mouth and doing this thing. And the music that it's, we put together, it doesn't have any melody, it doesn't have any words doesn't it? it hardly has rhythm but it's got to work for anybody and and on the whole it does and when after it's done and some some of the pieces get recorded and they hear it back once and then that recording is deleted and it has to some of the pieces incredibly beautiful and have a real emotional effect some of them are angry pieces some some work in totally different ways. But then it's gone. And all that's left for the person is the memory of what they took part in. I think that we will look back at, at the period, this, this, this period that we're, we're living through just now, this early 21st century period, as a period that we're moving into, music's going to be moving into another whole way of thinking about how it's made that that we will look back at the 20th the 20th century as the century of recorded music when it was the most important thing and we're entering a period where time place and occasion are going to be far more important elements of, of what music how music is made and how we jointly experience it. Music will always find ways to come through and find new interesting ways. And, and that, and, and I find that interesting. I find the, the idea that it rejects something, says, no, no, that's, that's gone now. We, we're not, um, it's moving over here now. And, and it will always come from the next generation or the generation after that will, and there'll always be people that are looking back, oh no, music was so much better when I was young. That's a lie. You know, if anybody ever tells you that music was better when they were young, they're lying. You know, they're fooling themselves. The best music is always yet to come. <laughs>